Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mallory Wesleyan Church. Got a couple people in the uh, fellowship hall still, but it's a wonderful morning. I want to welcome all the friends and family and people who are here today. Uh, it's a nice day out there too, isn't it? Yes. Beautiful day. It's for God's kingdom. Um, I'm going to start off by reading uh, from Psalms. Does anyone have a scripture that's on their hearts or they wanted to share this morning as we start off our service? I'm going to read from Psalms then. I'm going to read from Psalms 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and He is my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His, his faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, not the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, not the plague that destroys at midday. A thousands may fall at your side, ten thousands at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, and they will lift up their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on a lion and in a cobra, and trample the great, great lion and serpent, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name, and he will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. 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 Praise God. Uh, as we start off today's service, um, just a couple of announcements. We do have our, our small groups that meet, including our one here at 4, four o'clock on Sundays. We're looking at the Chosen uh, series um, on, online and while well, doing a Bible study with that. Um, we have Greg on Tuesdays and prayer and share with the ladies on Wednesday mornings. Other announcements, other things going on this month? Mike? I'm glad to be back, Pastor. Praise God, Mike. Glad to have you here. Everyone needs God. Amen? Amen. 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 Uh, well, let's pray and we'll get to worship, worshiping God and get our service started. Let's pray. Andrew. Yes. The baby bottle needs to come back next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Let me get some of these guys here. Oh. Oh. Anyone, got, any guys, anyone has some of these at their house, do they? <laughs> what? <laughs> Been a while? Okay. Well, some spares out there in the fellowship hall if you need to grab one. But they're due by Father's Day, which is next Sunday. next Sunday. So if you could bring them, we will pray over them as we're going to donate them to the Family Resource Center um, and their baby bottle drive to help fight uh, for parents' rights and help fight for saving the lives of children. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we are here to worship you. We are here because of you, God. It is your house that we have entered into. We cast aside the worries, the fears, the doubts of all the chaos of this world to be here in your sanctuary, in your house, with your people, Lord. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would flow inside of us, that you would refresh us and renew us, helping us to understand our, your purpose for our lives. Lord, help us to see you in the midst of all things. On this wonderful day, your creation, in the laughter and giggles of a small child, in the day-to-day -day faithful walk of someone who has prayed for us every single day. Help us to see your light shining through, your light shining through Christians, and help us to shine through 
as a light and a beacon of hope to those around us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we worship. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, the foretaste of glory divine.
for coming to us, to people such as us, to, to the people who are tired and weak, that you lift us up, that you help us and guide us each step, each day. Lord, we pray that you help us continue to stand in faith for you, to stand in the times that are difficult and rough, to be able to speak your truth in the situations that we encounter, Lord. We pray for your wisdom and your help. Lord, we pray for the lost, the people who don't even know you, that don't even know who Jesus Christ is, Lord, that they would come and seek the foot of the cross, that they would come and seek you through us, through coming into a church, through a, a brief conversation, through a billboard, through something, God, that you would show them that there is more hope than they know. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray this name in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You can be seated. Welcome again. We're going to take this morning's offering. If we could have a couple of volunteer ushers come help me out with that, I'd appreciate that. If we have anyone who wants to come help. Uh-oh, my one volunteer is, is, oh, well, there we go, we got a couple there, all right. Oh, good. Hey. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, Steve's wife let him, so we're good, all right? Come on, just take, take those and I'll pray and bring you back, okay? Thank you very much for helping out. Uh, let's pray over this offering this morning. Lord God, we ask you to bless these gifts that you're about to receive, that we would use them uh, for your glory, that we would give with joy as an act of worship, that saying that we love you more than these things, that we would uh, honor you and praise you through all of our service, our actions, and our giving, Lord. Help us to continue to be good stewards of your creation and help our lives be a beacon of hope and light for you. Our witness to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 In this time of desperation, all we know is God is here.
Um, I was thinking this morning that I probably should say hi to people, you know, because we're kind of like a family and kind of love each other and kind of care about each other. So please stand up, go around, shake some hands, give some hugs, give some elbows, say hello, welcome each other to God's house today. Amen. his name? Hugh. Yeah. Hugh. All right, we'll pray for Hugh and his heart problems and that, that he'll have some answers and he'll recover yeah. if possible. I know you said it's not looking good, but 
God has done has done miracles before. So we know. Did you ask something more? Did you raise your hand? I thought. Sorry. Sorry. Oh. Oh. He does miracles, miracles every day. Small, big, and what might seem small to us is just amazing in God's hands. So in Psalm 91, it says He knows our name. He knows who's small. He knows our name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what will. Wow. Amen. Sherry. He knows my son, Dan. He's recovering from his eye surgery. He has seven times the son of his eye back again. He can see seven times the son of his eye again. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Yes, Grover. You look great, Mike. I like the haircut. I feel better. I can drink good. Praise God. All right. Uh, Karen. I I just want prayers for my husband. Uh, he's getting a little better. He's still he's he's complaining about his legs hurting. And another prayer for him. Uh, I've been reading and I've been reading out loud, sitting on the porch, and he's been sitting here listening to me. So I just pray that maybe he'll. So we pray for Karen's husband that he would come to church and hear the words of God, be inspired to draw closer to him. So we'll continue to pray for that. All right, Lori. Thank you. 
God answering prayers. He's intervening in places that we don't even know. Isn't that amazing? So we'll continue to pray for your medical issues as well and any other bills that you're going to have. Maria, we'll continue to pray for those. Uh, other praises, prayers? Pat. Other things? All right. Um, well, I have one announcement. Um, it's, it's kind of a big one. So um, at the annual meeting, for those who were there at the annual meeting, I had announced um, that I'm going to be having surgery um, upcoming here. Uh, gastric bypass surgery is what I've done. I've talked to my doctors about it for a long time, and finally it's time to do so. Um, but they did set a surgical date for that, which is July 12th. And so July 12th, that's, yes, amen, amen. It's a great date, isn't it? I know, I know, this is the day. We'll probably be in the same room, who knows? Oh boy, me and Melody. And um, so I'd ask for your prayers for that as it's coming up at some point. And then, uh, of course, for the church, I'd ask that you continue to pray for our church throughout that time. I was telling the board from... Uh, earlier this week that it is, it is the time that is the most ripe for spiritual attack when when uh, people are down for the count and we need to make sure that we are bonding together in prayer, bonding together as a family of God at this church and continuing to come and fellowship um, here and, and learn from his word during those times, um, even when I'm out of commission for a little bit. So, um, so pray for that. July 12th is its upcoming here next month. Oh boy. So we'll pray to keep that in your thoughts and prayers. All right, anything else? Oh, Terry. Oh boy. What you tell us about it, Terry? see how many biblical numbers will happen on the 12th for me. How, how perfect and complete I could be. Yeah, that's it. Right. Let's take these prayer requests before God. Let's take these prayer requests before God. You're welcome to come and kneel with me at the altar. I'm always welcome to come up and kneel at the altar um, and pray uh, or bow your heads and hearts where you are. Lord God, we come to you knowing that you are the healer, you are the creator, you are sovereign, Lord of all. Lord, we thank you and praise you for all of these prayer requests that have been starting to be answered, even the ones we didn't even know about, God, that you provide money, that you provide healing, that you provide so much peace over situations that are beyond our control, God. Because we know that we have a Lord and Savior that cares. We know we have a Lord and Savior that is along, standing along our side through it all. We pray for those who are watching online today. We pray for those who are sick and hurting at home and recovering. People that come to my mind will be uh, Jen Lewis and, and Jean Graves, um, as well as many others, God, who are just um, need you in these moments. Lord, we ask for you to strengthen them and help them wherever they are at. God, Lord God, we thank you for our brother, uh, Mike, who's been back in our service today, um, becoming a new man, becoming new, as you make all things new, God, and renew us each day. Lord, we pray for him and his continued spiritual journey. Lord, we pray for um, Sherry's relative, Daryl, and her sister, who have now come out of uh, difficult, difficult times, Lord, and that you are going to see them through, through the next times as well, that you help them and guide them in their recoveries, 
um, Daryl with his heart and um, her sister with the physical therapy and the rehabilitation. God, help them. And God, that we pray for her son, Dan, who's now starting to see better and better. 75% God of his, of his sight. And we continue to ask that to be greater and greater. We pray and thank you for Melody, who's come today, sharing that she has a disease, that big C word, cancer. But Lord, we know that you are bigger than cancer. You are bigger than any disease or any uh, thing going on in our lives. And we lift her up to you today, that you would strengthen her during her time of waiting for surgery, her treatments, and her recovery, Lord. That you would strengthen her uh, by the power of Jesus Christ, that you'd be with the medicines and the doctors as she undergoes those treatments, and that she would be completely healed of this cancer. Lord, we pray for Rich's friend, Hugh, who has heart problems, and Lord, that it's not looking well, that Lord, you would intervene and intercede in his life to make his heart be corrected, to make his heart work well again, and have it be miraculous, Lord, have it be a miracle that heals him, God, and helps him through these next steps of his life. Lord God, we pray for Grover as he's undergoing his treatment um, here these next, this next to, uh, tomorrow, this next week, and, uh, and uh, the tests and treatments regarding his recovery, God, we pray for Grover in that. Lord, we thank you and praise you for Terry being here today, watching online at times. We pray for his grandson, as, as custody has been granted, Lord, and that you would be with his grandson throughout all of these, the midst of all of these things, that you would strengthen um, their relationships, God, and strengthen his grandson's faith, help him to see God for who God truly is. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the medical bills you've covered for Lori and the continued recovery on um, her illness and her um, uh, recovery for medical issues, Lord. Continue to heal her and help her throughout all these things. And Lord, we pray for Karen's husband that he would see and hear the truth, that he would know God the way she knows God, the way we know you, Lord, as Savior as friend, comforter, and king. Lord, we pray to you today in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Oh, I heard Don give me a louder mouth today, so I hope that's okay. Uh, so, I don't have many memories as from childhood. Uh, I, I remember my mom giving me a, a large refrigerator box once and said, do what you want with it. She gave me a bunch of crayons, and I think I made a rocket ship out of it, I don't know. Super fun. <laughs> might have been the house place that, it actually might have been both. It might have been the one and then tipped it over and the other. <laughs> kind of a little fuzzy in my brain. But one thing I do remember is in first grade, about the son, uh, age of my son Daniel, um, had a new teacher, but we also had a new place that we went once a week. I think it was Fridays. We went down to the library. <laughs> There's all those things there called books that I didn't know anything about because I, I, I barely knew my ABCs at the time. But what happened is they sat us all down at these tables and they had this big screen behind us. And then there was this little funny thing that gave out light in the background and went click, 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 click. And it projected pictures on the screens of different stories. Sometimes the slides were a little cockeyed, you know, so it was backwards and whatever. And then there was an audio track that went along with the story. And I would probably, I remember a couple of these, but I'd probably remember them as fairy tales um, or nice stories. You know, from Paul Bunyan to uh, Princess and the Frog to who knows whatever. But the thing I remember most, and I don't know if all the kids remember this from my from our story time at uh, my elementary school, but at the end, the librarian would come up to us and said, "What did that story mean? What did you learn from that fantastical story that we just watched and listened to? What was the moral of the story?" And that stuck with me throughout the years because I think that's what they were trying to teach. It wasn't really the story that was going on. It was the midst and culmination of all the things together that made you think about yourself 
and the transformational journey that you would go through to critically think about what's going on. Now I'll tell you, in our world today, we need reason and critical thinking. There's a cut, you know, we need to be able to think through problems and situations. We need to see the stories for what they are and the truth for what they are to know the answers. And as we read through our story today and finish our story today, um, I want you to think about the truths that are in this. But the book of Esther is not a fairy tale. Though, I'll tell you, many people will call it a fairy tale because of its dramatic nature and, and the way it's laid out and the way it all comes about. It seems just very miraculous in the nature of all how all these events weave together. But truly, this book of Esther is God's story, woven together so that Israel will be saved. So that you and I can become Christians someday and know and, and, and have this guy named Paul start writing all these letters so that the Christ, so that the Jewish church would survive, so that the Christian church can come, so that we would all know Jesus Christ and see that oncoming Messiah. And that we would know him again later on. And so Esther seems so much like a story that we would learn morals from. But really, we need to find God's truth in these pages. And so as I, uh, this is the second part of this, I started Esther last week. And so if you can remember a little bit with me, uh, we have our major players of Esther. We have Xerxes or King Abiraeus, um, who was a true, uh, Xerxes is truly uh, the king of Persia at the time. And uh, the, the Jews are in exile um, out in the, the, the land of Persia. And he is the king. He is not Jewish. He doesn't have much knowledge of Jews, and what happens is this gentleman, Haman, uh, has a little bit of history, a little bit of beef with the Jews. He is a Agite, uh, which is historically in the lineage um, of uh, a tribe that was against the Jews. And he sees Mor Mordecai, who was a Jewish man from the tribe of Benjamin, a lineage of Saul, not bow before him and gets be in his bonnet about it and wants to not just annihilate Mordecai, who he eventually considers his mortal enemy, he wants to annihilate all the Jews. And so he convinces Xerxes to write a decree, an unchangeable decree, that on a certain day, the Jews would all be abolished from the, I think it's 127 provinces of Persia at the time. Uh, that they would just be able to be killed and not be able to defend themselves in, in, in the midst of that. They would just have a death day. How would you feel if one year from now, someone decreed that all the Christians would be killed? How would you feel? I don't know. I, 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 I get out of Dodge. I don't know. It's amazing. Uh, the, the pressure and the feeling over the top of you uh, when, when that, that kind of comes when the, the ruler of that region, that province, basically the world at the time, would declare that kind of a thing. But God was working in the midst of things behind the scenes, woven together in the fabric of his plan for his people. And without even knowing it, this wonderful woman, Esther, becomes queen. The adopted daughter, or uh, we'll call her cousin of Mordecai, she, he was basically a father to her and is of Jewish descent, and she now has the ear of the king. And last week we talked about how she risked it all in going to the king to, to say the plot that had become the Jewish people, the plot that had become her in the midst of these things. And instead of, he said, to have my kingdom, I would give it to you. Just ask your request. And she asked him to go to a little thing. And they go and have a banquet, and she invites Haman, and she invites all these all these uh, people to this banquet. And then she goes, and he asks us again, to my to your half the kingdom, to your request, I wish I would give it to you. And then she says, Can we just have a private banquet between you, me, and Haman? And so that's where we come into our story here. Haman is plotting Mordecai's demise. 
uh, and at the end of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five, uh, Esther, or sorry, Esther in chapter five starts to do these um, requests, and on chapter six, Haman goes to the king in the middle of the night, and the king had remembered that Mordecai had saved an assassin's plot against him. And so he wants to honor Mordecai. And so he asks Haman, his trusted advisor, the second, the second most important person in the kingdom, I have a man who I would want to honor. And Haman says to himself, who would the well, king want to honor more than me? And so he recommends all these lavish things. And in chapter five, or sorry, chapter six, Verse 10, he starts to say, Go at once, the king commanded to Haman. Get the robe, get the horse, and do just as usage is suggested to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect, neglect anything you have recommended. So Haman got a robe and a horse. He rode Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him that what is to be done for this man, the king delights to honor. Afterwards, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeshresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. And his advisors and his wife, Zeresh, said to him, Since Mordecai before you has, whom your downfall started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You surely will come to ruin. While they were still talking to them, the king, the eunuchs arrived and hurried um, Haman away to the banquet that Esther had prepared to him. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. Of course, Haman's super tired after staying up all night and then riding Mordecai through the horse, horse and through town. And they went on drinking wine on that second day. The king asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. What is your request? Even up to half of the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request, for I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, but no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked the Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is the man that dared to do so such a thing? Esther said, An adversary of the enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen, and the king got up in rage and left his wine and went out to the place of the garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. And just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. And the king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while he is still in, in with me in the house? And as soon as the words left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And the harbun, one of the eunuchs, attended to the king, and a pole reaching a height of 50 cubits stands at Haman's house. He had set it up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. And the king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided. The end. And they all lived happily ever after, right? The evil villain is vanquished. Haman, who wished to kill the Jews, is dead. This is the way a fairy tale would end. But our Bible is truth, and it's history. Esther risked it all by asking the king this request. She put her life on the line, identifying herself finally as a Jew. And now the people will start to know that they have a Jewish queen. The people will know that Jews have a, have a place and purpose in this kingdom and life. And God, even though 
uh, Xerxes was enraged. He, he uh, went aside to the garden briefly to gather his thoughts and came back. See, what happened back in the day is uh, they were, uh, instead of sitting in seats at tables or sitting at, at seats like normal, they usually reclined at couches to eat and do things. And so Haman, trying to beg the queen, he tumbled over her and caught uh, himself in a compromising position when the king came, came back in. That was, that was just not Haman's day, I'm telling you. It was not a good day for him. Um, and as I said last week, um, this analogy, or this, this story can be used as an analogy for Jesus Christ. Mordecai, the faithful Jew, the faithful one who is trying to uphold uh, the law, is set to die on this stake, the gallows is what they call it, but it's a big old 50-foot pillar stake that they would impale people on to kill them. And the method of his own destruction and plotting by the evil one, Haman, became the evil one's own end. And the victory of the Jews is the next part of the story, is the next stage of what's going to go on. And so, I'm not going to I, I would love to read the next couple chapters, but I'm going to summarize them a little bit for us just so we can have an understanding. What's going on is, if you understand, Haman was the second in command. He was the vice president. He held the signet ring of the kingdom. And so any order that he would put down and use his uh, signet into the, into the letter or stamp into the official notice, was as if the king would have said it. And so, judging and honoring Mordecai, the king decides to give Mordecai this honor. And Mordecai becomes the second in command of the kingdom. He decides to give all of Haman's possessions and things to Esther, who gives it to Mordecai, because um, she is his father, uh, surrogate father, and wants to honor him through this. And so the people seeing that now not only the queen, but the second in command of the, of the, the, the country are Jewish, some of them start to convert to be Jews. But the rest of the story is not necessarily a happily ever, ever after, because this decree of death is still over the people, still over the Jewish people. And so, in chapter 8, Esther goes again, in chapter three, in verse 3, Esther pleaded again, falling and weeping at his feet, she begged the king to put an end to the evil plan of Haman, the Agite, which had devised against the Jews, and then extend, and the king extended the golden scepter to Esther as she arose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, as it regards to favor, it's the right thing to do. If it pleases with me, in order to be written, overruling the dispatches of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agai, devised to roy and destroy the Jews in the provinces. For how can I bear to see this disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? And so, on verse 8, he says, Now write another decree after appointing Haman, or after appointing Mordecai to be, have the signet ring and be the second in command. Now write another decree in the king's name on behalf of the Jews, as it is best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written without the king's name and sealed with this ring can be revoked. And at once Mordecai summons all the, all the scribes, all the people from all the, I think I said 120, 127 provinces who all speak different languages, and they devise this plan that, and they write this decree that on that day, in addition, the Jews who normally would not be able to defend themselves can now rally together, defend themselves, and actually destroy those who have harm done to them, that the women, the children, the men, all could rise up and do so. And probably having around eight months of planning, eight months of distribution of these letters and things to the various provinces and regions, they do it. And I'm telling you, it's like a civil war. I'm sure many people who were going to fight didn't fight anymore because now Queen Esther, the, Jew is, or the Queen is a Jew and Mordecai is there. 
but some people did. And it says the Jews were victorious. Victorious to the point where they even took out um, Haman's ten sons so that no retribution would come upon them from that family line. God's provision was there for the Jews. And what happens in chapter, uh, end of chapter 9, is they celebrate a holiday called Purim. Purim to signify the freedom of the Jews during this time, that this death and destruction that was looming over their head now is done and gone, and that they were victorious, and so they celebrate. Even to this day, the Jewish people celebrate a two-day two feast of Purim. Um, and that's one way that we know that the book of Esther is true, and they read the book of Esther during that time. So, in the book of Esther, what are truths for us to take forward to today? God loves and cares for his people. Even before Mordecai and Esther tried to devise this plan of coming before the king and asking him to destroy Haman and trying to come and get all these things reversed and to save their Jewish people, God's hand was in that situation. He had already, Queen Vashti had already been taken out of the court and the king was looking for a new queen. Esther being the perfect one to be put in place for just a time as this. Before all of this happened, he knew Mordecai was in the city. He, he brought him probably to Persia for this very purpose. A faithful man in the king's treasury, working in the, in the king's courts for various purposes, knowing uh, the things going on. In fact, they believe that the book of Esther was written by Mordecai. Uh, they can't confirm it, but all the details of the king's court and the things ahead of time that would have gone on would have had to have been written by someone who was around all of these places of business and things going on um, in, the, in the inner workings and behind the king's doors. Our service to our God is the other big truth that I see. Esther took a step of faith, took a step of courage and zeal that God puts us in a certain place in a certain time for us to step forward with the faith that we have for the task that God puts before us. And it might be something small or it might be something big like this, but are you stepping forward in your faith each time God says, do this. Do this, Mike. Do this, Rich. Do this, Terry. Do this, Faith. Are we stepping forward in those ways? In God's provision for us? Because it feels like a free fall. It feels like Esther going before the most powerful person who can just kill us like that. And luckily, and not luckily, provision providentially, that golden scepter is given and put out to Esther each time because of her humility, because of her position, because of God providing all of these things for her and preparing her for those moments. Mordecai. Mordecai becoming the man who God wants him to be. The, the, step, the faithful father of Esther throughout all that time has to give up his only child to potentially become queen and maybe be in the harem and never see her again. Eventually becomes the second most powerful person in the kingdom because he continues to stand with God throughout all of the times of trials and tribulations. During the times of declaring that the Jews would die, he rips his clothes off and covers himself with ashes and sackcloth, mourning. What can be done about this God? Help us, God. Help your people. Esther calls for a three-day and three-night fast, and he's the one who helps usher those things in to try to get God in that spiritual battle on, along our, on, on our side to go forward. 
A lot of these lessons are applied here today. Because there are enemies about around us everywhere. I'm going to tell you that just because Haman's the enemy in this story doesn't mean that there's not an enemy lurking out there for us today. And we need to be faithful. We need to step forward in our faith with God to help make sure that we're not just cowering in fear and walking away when we need to step up. God loves you. And he is weaving your life just like he has woven in the tapestry of Esther that for us to be able to see as an example here of history, he is weaving your life for a purpose and for a time as well. So pray. Pray about what God has for you next because he will use you as you are a willing vessel for him. Amen? One other fun thing about the book of Esther, and I don't have it in front of me today, um, there is something called the Apocrypha. You anyone ever hear of the Apocrypha? It is a list of uh, books of the Bible, uh, books of writings that are kind of Bible adjacent. They are set aside um, for uh, not necessarily going into the Bible, but were in a consideration of books to possibly put into our Bible when our Bible was formed back in the um, centuries ago now. And around the fifth, uh, 5 BC, they wrote several editions to the book of Esther in what they would call apocalyptic style. Do you guys know any other book that was written in apocalyptic style? <laughs> Maybe one out there, right? Maybe one. And so um, they used the book of the Apocrypha of the book of Esther, actually, because what the Apocrypha in the book of Esther does is it actually describes the story of Esther. Two giant dragons facing off against each other in a battle of will and might to tr for fighting for the kingdom. And the little river coming into becoming the big river that is Israel. And all these images that are in this apocalyptic type style. And because we know the book of Esther and it's written out for us very clearly and plainly, what happens is they use those things to kind of gain insight into how apocalyptic literature was written at the time so we can understand the book of Revelation better and more. Because I'll tell you, that book of Revelation, that's a tapestry with a whole bunch of missing pieces for some people. If you ever tried to read the book of Revelation, I've always recommended it to think of it as a painting or a tapestry of images that mean other things in that apocalyptic type, type style. And those meanings could be certain things or it could be other things, but there are definitely biblical references to what some of them mean in the book of Esther the book of other, other books of the Bible to say this usually means Israel, this usually means someone powerful, this usually means something that is destruction and how that goes about. Learning our Bible and gaining better insight and drawing closer to God is what we need to do during these times. Whether you believe it's the end times or not, we are still called to be Christians. We are still called to be disciples, we are still called to love, share, and preach the gospel to every last soul that will be around us. Even if the, the, the house is burning, we need to be able to help those around us as our Christian call has, us, has, has called us to do. Let's pray, and we'll finish with our last song. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for the lessons that we learned through your word. Lessons that aren't necessarily a moral of the story, Lord, but they change us from knowing them better. Lord, we pray that through this book and study of Esther, that you have taught us more about our faith. That you would challenge us to be ready to risk it all. To have zeal and boldness in those situations that you want us to step up that knowing that you have our back and 
the most desperate of situations and that we will be willing to go to the cross for you. Lord, we thank you for our salvation. We thank you for your care needs for us. Lord, it seems like this time we need you more than ever. We need you more than ever. And Lord, we pray that you continue to fill us and be in our lives in every situation. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Please stand and sing our last song.
Lord God, I pray for this congregation to have the zeal and boldness to seek and save the lost. That they would be able to share their witness of what Jesus Christ has done in their lives for to be a witness of Christ in this world. Help this church be a beacon of hope and light, a lighthouse for those who need to be saved. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. See you all next week. Thank you for coming today. I think what we'll do is move it uh, a couple of pews closer, okay?